the first three weeks of the eruption here in Hawaii, crazy things would happen in the middle of the night. A new fissure would open up and it would threaten a new neighborhood. Thousands of people were evacuated from their homes. I started the Hawaii Tracker Facebook group to help people understand what's going on and get their questions answered. Hey, how's it going? We're live. This is Fissure 20. We had hundreds of people all throughout the neighborhoods sending in videos, and articles, and images. We spend a lot of time making sure the accurate information gets out. This is live. It's still lava moving. They weren't just sharing a story. They were helping their neighbor. If a family member was being evacuated, my group would just jump in and help out. So it was huge. They were watching out for each other. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you for the support from everybody. As we go through this, we're growing closer together as a community. When tragedies like this strike, you really realize how much you need each other. Uh, hello everyone, I am geologist Philip Ong, here with Mr. Dane DuPont, on behalf of HawaiiTracker.com, bringing you guys another Kilauea Volcano update today, Tuesday, April 6th, 2021. We are now on day 107 of Kilauea's ongoing summit eruption, and it continues largely unchanged since our last update, only very minor changes, the lake, lake surface is still moving, still very slowly rising, those kind of things, gas is still fluctuating. Um, otherwise, our depth hasn't really changed uh, uh, by a meter. We've changed in smaller variations now. We'll show you the details. SO2 is, is still around 850, 850 tons per day. And besides that, there's been a, a 4.3 earthquake on the slopes of Mauna Loa that uh, put out, the USGS put out a statement about. So we'll cover all that and start off with a couple of new pictures here that the US, USGS has put out. And this one is a, is a close-up of this west vent here within the pit of Hale Ma'uma'u, which is that inner crater within Kilauea Volcano's summit caldera. And not a whole lot of change, still glowing on the top of these vents up here. We still have that entry that's coming in mostly from this northeast branch that began with this overflow about a month ago. The overflow had made a small perched pond in this area that burst out. It made a new lava pathway essentially that's crusted over it goes something like this which is different than our original path which was more somewhere in the range of like this or possibly like this so those are the minor minor changes in the last week uh, otherwise this area right here in the foreground that's 
one of the farthest west points of this lava lake that's perched. There's a, a rim up here that's holding it in, so it allows it to sit at a higher level within this than outside of here. And there's some previous order level levels farther down here as well, just off the photograph. But this is mo most of what you see as far as red lava on the surface today uh, from USGS photographs. Is this overturning process right here. So this being one of the more stagnant parts of the lava lake that's not constantly moving, you do have a, a thicker crust forming over this more stagnant area. And then it all break apart and get recycled back under and be replaced by a new liquid surface that then repeats the cycle again and again and again. And that's something we talked about and showed you guys the, the close-ups on the thermal videos last week as, as well. That's um, ongoing. We have a nice US just photograph of it happening at the end of last week here, April 2nd. So there it is, right in there. And otherwise this crust is moving. It was moving very slowly still based on the last USGS time lapses that are put out, all sped up. So it's when I say circulation, I'm not saying it's churning and bubbling and, and all of that. It's a, it's a slow creeping of that lava lake surface. And of course, below the surface, the lava could be moving a little bit faster, but it seems like overall, it's not nearly as vigorous as it has been um, a month ago or a month before that or a month before that. So, so here we are. Um, Otherwise, uh, I thought I would replay this video from December 31st from, first from the USGS here. And this is showing this foundering process, right? So we don't have any new videos, but I thought we could look at this one one more time. And this is the kind of thing I'm talking about when you have a crest getting a little stagnant. This was more in the north and east part of the, of the large lava lake in Halemaumau, early on in the eruption. And now this process has happened. This whole area is all the way solidified and crusted over, and the same process is happening at other parts of the lava lake, and that's that's the analog here. So you can kind of see it's just very slow movement. A lot of fresh lava coming up and replacing it. And even this has sped up as well, right? You can see maybe a slow movement of this crust getting getting rafted over from left to right. Another view here at nighttime showing the crust getting replaced. So Mahalo USGS for their great coverage there. We'll come back to our current photographs. This one here is another April 2nd. And this is a, a view of one of these ooze outs as we have been describing for the last week and a half or so. Even longer really, right? Since you know, for a while we, we've been seeing at this area at the edge of this lava crust. The word lava has been oozing out presumably because there's some gap, right? The crater is flared upwards. And so as this whole crust is rising, um, being lifted by the liquid that's filling underneath it, it's creating that gap and that allows the lava to ooze out in those areas. So I think this is great because we haven't seen, we haven't seen anything quite so zoomed in and we'll see what, how zoomed in we can get here. You can see that big sulfur bank right in there. And you can see it seems like a channel of fairly fluid lava, right? This is not spiny stuff. It's not it's like it's very viscous necessarily that you can tell. It's not like a, any kind of semi-solid. It's definitely liquid lava that's come up and you can see it's actually flowing along the surface. And, you know, from left to right in this view right in here. That direction right in here. So I can hand it over. You guys can see some of the other parts of this. See, there's no nowhere that this lava is coming on a surface, right? That's how we can tell it's oozing out from below. And there it is on its more northern end, and over here on its more eastern end. You can see it's flowing right over the boundary between these boulders that are making up the old crater wall, the collapse of 2018 and the fresh lava of a 107-day eruption ongoing so far. So, pretty interesting there. And um, here is a most recent time lapse from their S1 camera, the last 24 hours or so. So I'll show you guys this first. It's just a little bit more, more uh, animated view of what's happening at the summit now. You can see that circulation happening within this 
surface of this uh, raised lava lake. And here is that little bay on a, on a west, west southwest area right in there that we we're looking at as red lava early on. So that's basically it. Not a whole lot of changes. You don't even see any of these islets moving. It seems nothing's rising or falling. Not a whole lot of change there. There was a slight adjustment in the tilt, but uh, uh, we'll get into that shortly here later. So here's a more of a wide angle view. Not a whole lot of change there. That was in, on a second. And four days later, um, six, very similar view there as well. So can I zoom in here? But it's very similar to what you guys just saw in other sharper photographs and in the animation shown in the USGS camera there. We will get some, to some questions here at the end of our, our summary of the current images and signals. But we'll keep going through the time lapses for now. Here's a view from the, the KW camera on the west rim of Kilauea Caldera. So this this is a wider angle, angle view. I have it zoomed in here. If I zoom it out, you can see the whole camera. You can see all of Kilauea Caldera going all the way out across the background there. And within it, you see that inner pit of Hale Ma'u Ma'u. And within it, you see that lid of the fresh lava surface of this 2020-2021 eruption. And within that, is why I needed to zoom in, is where the lava is actively circulating. And possibly slightly less on this little west bay right over here. And otherwise, steady on. That's the visual. That's the same view as we've been looking at from the thermal camera for a while now. So in the thermal camera, same kind of stability there. You see a little bit, a little bit less motion in this part, part of the thermal image continuing still. And you do see more of a focus to the northeast in that direction of this west vent that's been continuous. It hasn't stopped at any point yet. And, um, so yeah, that's the last 24 hours. Pretty stable there. So I wanted to also replay here um, since mid-January when we had that back crest form. And so most of the action happening now besides the circulation and discussion recently has been these ooze outs coming up along the edge. And so I thought it'd be interesting to replay that one more time for you guys uh, from this date on January 11th, moving forward here. Just kind of track the first ooze outs as they happened here, kind of everywhere at once along this back rim. And then after we have that initial big deflation, it comes more in pulses. And so here you can see motion along the back here. See, it was more on this. This is south. That's north, right there. You see it more on this eastern, north to south rim, until more recently when you do see more of that coming over here. You got to be careful when we're looking at these brighter signals on the rim of the crater that they're not necessarily overflows of a lava lake. They're filling in the trenches. And then when I'm playing the time lapse this fast, it's hard hard to really tell. So uh, play it one more time. And what you're looking for is the ones that it's more convincing along this backside. The ones where you can really see it come up, that pink line come up with no lava flow nearby, no lava lake nearby. So that's much of the, of the action now is, is tracking the ooze ups along the margin of this lifting lid and tracking the variations in the, in the surface of this moving lava lake. And otherwise, things are fairly steady. The lava is coming out fairly steady. The gas is coming out fairly steady. It did fluctuate back up to 1,200 tons or so last week. But our most recent update here from the USGS is at 850 tons per day, measured yesterday, April 5th. And the lava lake is still at 225 meters, 738 feet deep. And stagnant on its eastern half and otherwise there's no uh, new information um there is a longer text update here for those of you guys who want to read, read it in full it's full content here so but it's all the same as recently so i'll move on show you guys this long-term pattern of so2 so tons per day is our axis here on the left we peaked early on within the first few days close to fifty thousand tons per day 
dropped way off to under 10,000 in the 5,000 and under range. That was the first month of eruption. And ever since then, if I zoom it back out, we've been in this approaching zero realm, really since the, that crust formed over that eastern half of the lava lake. So we zoom in a little more. You can see some of the scatter, some of this variation. There is that 1200 plot and our 850 most recently over here. And to believe me, I have to scroll this back over so you guys can see. 1,200, 1,800 tons per day is a range of what we're looking at now. So you see some variation, and we do know that there's some changes with the deflation and inflation events and the gasness of the lava that's coming out. So that's normal, and more of the range of it's what we're interested in. So it was interesting that we had one that was higher up above 1,000 again. That's the highest we've had, but it's still within that range we've had in the last month. So rather than saying it's trending down, Maybe only one data point, but it seems like it may be maintaining that range though, and still just chugging along long term steady state, just oozing out. And still no signs of, at least in the gas, of any sharp drop off or any radical change in how the gas is coming out of the volcano. So that means there's still been VOG, um, some VOG, and closer to the source before, before that volcanic kind of gas has a chance to really change into all those particulates by reacting in the atmosphere. You, you do get more of the stink and the, the SO2, and I've been smelling H2S in the air too, especially in some of the evenings with slack winds up here in the volcano area. So VOG is ongoing here. It's a forecast from volcano uh, from the VOG map project, UH Manoa. So the lava lake continues rising. There's a new USGS map through April 5th, really just updating the depth of it. Not a whole lot different as far as the contours. You can see we're getting more detail in our little islets, and we actually can see our west bay right over there on the scale of this map as well. So just another iteration here. And it's still not visible. We'd have to make it all the way up to this green line. And so it is still slowly rising, but the rate is what's, what matters here. So looking at the whole rate of the eruption early on when we're we're making those really fun and we knew that we we're going to be totally unrealistic projections of how fast it would fill and whether it be visible we were dealing with this first part of the eruption here like well if it keeps going up at this rate then you can visit see it really really soon and of course like well if it keeps going up at that rate you could see it not as soon or if it was up at that rate then you can see it at some rate as well and what's happened over time is this curve has gotten flatter and flatter and flatter so now now our rate is a very long slow flat and and there's no prospect of that thing rising very fast. Yep, so here it is, a little bit more zoomed in. And you can see for the last week or so, ranging between 224, 225, and 225.6 up here meters. You see these small scale variations up and down on an overall pattern. Of that was of, that was rising, and just in the last couple of days here, you see it's dipped down a little bit and then come back up, and, and that relates to a small deflation inflation event we had. And what I'll do is I'll scroll down here. This is the last week monitoring. I'll scroll past the earthquakes, which are minimal in Kilauea, and show you guys this one week tilt plot right here. And you can see that between the fourth and the sixth, we have our tilt at Wikahuna. Dipping down, having a fairly flat flat bottom event, and then coming back up. It's almost a U, more of a U shape here, rather than being being a sharp bottom deflation inflation event. We have a fifty dollars super chat from Love the Color Orange. Says uh, thanks for thanks to you both. I uh, appreciate your work. Uh, mahalo, mahalo. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, mahalo, for your support. Mahalo. So yeah, we can correlate this deflation inflation pulse right here. I scroll up back to the lava depth that corresponds to the small slowdown we had over here. So currently, if we look at this value, that would be 225.4. Technically, still 225 meters. We can't round it up yet. So that's why our number hasn't changed, and we have still the lava lake slowly rising, but you really see that it's rising from 224.2 maybe to 
225.4, meters in the whole week or so, and taking into account this small event over here as well. So we can look at the deflation, inflation on a bigger scale. Here's that small deflation inflation on a one month plot from Uekahuna. So now our now our scale is four microradians, two microradians, zero. So two per hash mark here, and that's about you can see we're a little bit over two in the range of three microradians and coming back up higher than that for that last small deflation inflation event, which is similar to the one we had previous to that. Both of which have been smaller than what we saw, saw previous to that, where they were all of this larger variety, and they seem to have more of this this V-shaped bottom for a large for a for the, for the most part, where it come down and pop back up, more like we see here, down here, and down. See a little bit of complexity in there, and a little bit of complexity in there. So it's it's not not a hundred percent that way. But interesting to note the the slightly smaller since about the 20th or so compared to the ones before that right and i point that out because we'll look here at the usgs kilowatt deformation page last two days here we are coming out of that deflation inflation event from minus 1.5 to positive 2 so 3.5 microradians there here that here's that same one week plot on its own page and for the last month we're still getting blown out by this poo signal back over here so we have here's our small event right over here small little blip compared to these other little blips over here on the left okay so we look coming to look at the GPS cross Kilauea summit so now we're looking at meters over here and this is a, the difference in the position of these stations right which are across north and south across Kilauea caldera and what we've been noting for a while is that after that initial drop, the relief of the eruption beginning back in December, we've had we had an initial period of it seemed like some balance where we were flat, and then we started having deflation inflation events that were superimposed upon a rising pattern, a rising trend, right? Meaning that caldera was spreading apart, at the, the north and, and south rims were getting farther apart which normally you presume is because of magma coming into the system, um, whether it's from actually forcefully pushing, pushing the side of the caldera apart or the south flank moving on its own and making space. That's a whole other mechanics and dynamics kind of thing. But in any case, the caldera seem to be spreading and rising in some areas along its, its rims. And that's what seems to, to be, have been, be different here. That's the biggest difference we can really see. And the signal is, is that seems to have really slowed down its rate. So it possibly flatlined here for the last getting close to a month now. And that might be the, the first signal we have of something changing. Right? Of course, this is, this is interesting times because we do have Mauna Loa to the north. And it's possible if Mauna Loa starts pushing its way and pushing from the north and pushing against Kilauea that could have some effect and offset some of the signal. And so that's something I would, I would need more information from USGS to really separate out of here um, to make sure there's not any kind of effect of a neighboring mountain on here as well. But interesting to note that there is a, that continues that, that this period of, of not, not really contracting or extending at, uh, is lasting longer, as long, if not longer, than only one we've had previously when eruption switched over right after it began. So that's the most noteworthy thing we have right there uh, on Kilauea. Otherwise, coming to the earthquakes, I kind of teased it a little bit there. We know that Mauna Loa is still filling with magma. Uh, it's, it's all over the entire edifice, right? This whole volcano is a, is a big network of, of magma pathways. Um, first in this whole summit storage area, and then not to mention the rift zones themselves, which are a whole other aspect we'll get into when when it is appropriate. But there's still a few earthquakes happening in that cluster northwest of the caldera, which is the area that we have seen based on Frank Trusdell's presentations uh, on Mauna Loa during Volcano Awareness Month earlier this year. That we that there was evidence of these this north station actually getting pushed from the north and moving to the south, 
as well, so showing some locus of activity to the north of the caldera. And that's normal, the volcano will build in all of its areas. We think that there is some deeper pathway that might activate this northwest part of the volcano seismically before it activates the summit and upper southwest rift normally is what, what goes off. But the most recent activity in the volcano, as far as earthquakes, has not been up there. It's been down here, close to Wood Valley, close to Pahala. So this spot right in here was a 4.3 earthquake that occurred at about 8 kilometers down. It's uh, about 5 miles down. So that's within that sheet, that flank, the side of the volcano. And we're not near any of the magma pathways here. But it is natural that the volcano's flank wants to adjust to any changes happening at the summit as well. Right? And so this is one of the areas of adjustment of Mauna Loa, the Hilea seismic zone right here. It connects to the Kauiki seismic zone right over here. It's a little bit closer to Kilauea. And in either of those cases, it's interesting that we are seeing a little bit bigger earthquakes, but we still haven't had one big enough yet to really portend something more to come. So we see adjustments happening there, but you know how the magnitudes work, right? A magnitude 6 earthquake is, is uh, exponentially bigger than magnitude 5 earthquake, which is exponentially bigger than magnitude 4 earthquake. So we're in a range of 4s, and we're looking for something more in the range of 5 or 6 still. So interesting to see it picking up a little bit, but... Uh, nothing really showing any major change, and that's what the USGS has put out. Here's their statement that was issued uh, over the weekend on Saturday. Um, they do mention it was preceded by a 3.9. This was 11.02 a.m. and 11.15 a.m., the 3.9 and 4.3. And they have, have noted they have not observed any changes in activity at Mauna Loa or Kilauea as a result of this earthquake. So we have a $20, $20.99 CA super chat from the Canadian Neurovascular Health Society, uh, particularly Sandra. It says, uh, thanks for your uh, consistently high quality presentations. Mahalo from Canada. Uh, Mahalo, thank you, Sandra. Thank you. Yeah, so no changes to either volcano as a result of the earthquake. And this is. Uh, in more detail, both the 4.3 and 3.9 earthquakes appear to be slip along vertical faults caused by southeast motion of Mauna Loa's south flanks. And they're just making sure that people realize that's different than the Pahala earthquakes that are deeper and slightly to the east of here. Right, so if I look, go back to the map, here's a Pahala zone right in here. Those are all the deep earthquakes related to the magma source right over here. So our little cluster of the 4.3 and that's a 3.9 right in there, and there's also a 1.1 right in there that all kind of clustered together. Those are the ones that we're talking about. So if this lengthy statement is, is not succinct enough, uh, we have a Twitter post here by US Just Volcanoes that sums it up really quite well. And this will read out, will read out and they say, quote, Mauna Loa will erupt at some point, so vigilance is key. But this earthquake was not directly related to magma movement. Rather, it was a fault that ruptured." End quote. So there you have it. There is really no point to dive into that any further today. We'll, we'll resume more Mauna Loa discussion uh, on our Friday update um, when we go into more detail and we'll talk, talk about connections of Kilauea and Mauna Loa at that point as well. So that is information we have uh, on the volcanoes today. So uh, with that, I'll uh, turn to Dane here and we will say some of our mahalos and we got a few of them to go through so i'll try and knock them out pretty quickly um i do want to thank anybody that uh helped you know sustain this channel this uh, type of content by making a donation on hawaiitracker.com support where we do take the majority of our donations uh the super chats definitely help as well but i do want to shout out the people that have uh done the that went through the website uh so brenda p uh Linda H, which did it monthly, which really helps. Those monthlies are tremendous. Uh, Mark D and Melinda H, um, I really appreciate it uh, on that side. We also have um, some sponsors that we want to shout out as well. So we have our two uh, big sponsors that you know we've had for a few weeks now, uh, Kaleo's Bar and Grill in the heart of Pahoa, uh, giving some unique experiences uh, with a little bit of twists on some local cuisine, but also you know reasonable prices, great uh, customer service, variety on the menu, some specials that rotate in, makes it unique each time. Really a great place to go, even you know 
for tourists or for locals, it, you know, I, I go in there regularly. It's a great restaurant. Um, can't say enough. Uh, the other one is Kalani Tours in uh, Kona and Hilo. They uh, specialize in volcano, waterfall, coffee tours, uh, among the others. And one of the cool things about Kalani that uh, did recently was we just uh, wrote a little bit about them because they had a interesting little uh, day where they got the, a New York logistics company for vaccine distribution mistakenly called them looking for a basically an emergency uh, transport of some dry ice to keep the the vaccine the vaccines I think it was a Pfizer ones at minus eighty degrees Celsius and nobody on the island was available they tried calling taxis everybody eventually they got asked as a favor basically to go and do this to uh, to deliver this uh, dry ice so they. Uh, put apart a little bit of time to go and get the dry ice, drop it off at the uh, the pharmacy, I believe it was, CVS. Just an interesting little, you know, story, but, you know, that's what it's all about out here is, you know, uh, people stepping up to that occasion to help, you know, do something for, uh, help, you know, out the greater community. And that's what we're all about. So we appreciate Kalani Tours being an official sponsor as well. Uh, with that, I think we're ready for some questions. All right, so we got some uh, some good ones today, and some that we've done before. But it's always good to go back, and you know, not everybody's heard the answers to these questions before. So Sandra, since just made that donation, let's start with that one. Um, do they name eruptions only by giving the year, or their uh, distinct names given? Like, what is the naming process in general? Oh, well, so I, I can really only speak from the the scientific side of it right you know i imagine that mm -hmm. there are probably culturally certain eruptions or or, or events and time and they may have names but that's right. not and not not something that, that i know uh, enough to share share with you guys you know so like that aside i can say that scientifically um it's it's common that the volcanoes that are erupting um are gonna do that more than once in human history so then it becomes important to differentiate which one and which. And so we quite often do just come down to the the, uh, the location and then the, the, the time as well, right? And depending on whether you have only one eruption per year, you can just get away with just a year. Or sometimes you have to say it was the it was the the, the February right, nineteen seventy four yeah. as opposed to the November nineteen seventy four um, mm -hmm. eruption kind of thing, right? And you you might get more specific and say, well, it was. Uh, not just Kilauea eruption, but southwest rift eruption or southeast rift eruption or a particular spot, Makapui crater, or what have you. You know, um, there's different ways of doing it. Right. Yeah, the one sure. that immediately jumps out in my mind is uh, how do we get to uh, kind of a follow up question from me? And sorry to put you on the spot on this one, but um, Pu'o'o, the the 61G and the episodes that we went through with Pu'o'o and the like. At what point do you think they went to like, hey, we're going to need to move to a different uh, mechanism for uh, naming these uh, events uh, as opposed to, you know, just our nomen normal nomenclature where, you know, oh, it's, it's the 1960 flow. Uh, and maybe you say the 1960 Kapoho eruption. Um, but with the, the Puo, we have these very specific delineations, it seems like. And that's, you know, at what point do you start talking about that? Yeah, I mean, if you if you do in the case of Puo, what really made it unique was was that it was a long term eruption. Is one part of it, but when it began, it began with episodic high fountaining, and so it was mm -hmm. actually episodic, and that led you to start numbering the episodes. This is the first episode. This is the second episode, and the third episode, and so that's how we ended up with sixty one episodes. Uh, 61g right and mm -hmm. something had to happen in between where either the event had to shift you had some pause interruption you know there are many pauses that might have been two weeks or sometimes longer where lava wasn't coming out the volcano was still hot and lava was still moving through there but we didn't consider the eruption to be over it was just paused so okay so that it came about in the beginning that's the it didn't like get phased in later basically 
Well, that's, yeah, you know. it kind of and it kind of just kept going, right? And and they they could have, and this has been brought up and by one of our at least one of our viewers in the past. They, you know, could have said, okay, well, when Kupai Naha opens up, that could be a whole new eruption. We could start over, but they actually at that point lumped it in and said we're going to keep it's essentially a, a new event, even if it is a half mile away, and we're not going to you know culturally, you might have said that's a different eruption there because it's in a different place. But they're mm -hmm. saying, well, it's the same process happening. We're going to lump it in together and that's how we kept going as well right and right um we actually have a fissure uh you know uh coming up in the pal crater in 1997 along with the collapse of pool being one of the episodes for example of an eruption of pool right it's just it's kind of spread around back and forth all, all over the place there and right. yeah that's kind of you know how, how i began and it's interesting that it went from being episodic at the beginning to being more continuous later on right so then it seemed like you had to go from not just the episodes but 61A, 61B, 61C, 61D, and you know that's right. when you start thinking. Okay, you, you know if you're outlining your your term paper, like at that point you're getting into too much little little minutia yeah. of numbering, right? <laughs> there is um, an interesting aspect of that as well with the, um, what we saw in 2018, where you can get locked into something that you initially thought was a good idea, but as it starts playing out in the long run, you're like, oh, maybe we should change that because we saw how the we just started uh, whenever Fisher came out. That's Fisher one, two, three, four. And then it started to be like, okay, well, what's a Fisher now? Because we have these long areas with, it looks like two Fishers, but there could be a third in between them, or you could say that that's one long Fisher perhaps, and it started right. those types of debates. And then we got to the point where we had 22 Fishers, and it's a patchwork where it's like just jumping around and it made no sense other than you had to be paying attention uh, chronologically to make it make sense. And that easily could have gotten uh, cumbersome if it would have kept going. And we're talking like, oh, it's Fisher 54 and Fisher 5 are active. Like that would have been madness, right? Right. But it could have easily done that type of stuff. Um, but we could have been locked into like, oh, okay, we're now at, you know, we're, if it was a Pulo style eruption, like, oh, it's 10 years later on Fisher uh, 79, <laughs> you know, or something like that. It, it could get It could get wild that way. Sorry to take uh, so much time on one question, but figure that one's worthy of a little discretion. Um, so Jerry Baker on YouTube asks uh, about the geochemistry. Um, does the lava chemistry of this eruption match the chemistry of previous eruptions? Basically, do we know where the lava flow is coming from? We've I only had we saw that one. Yeah, we've only, yeah, we've only seen one result of geochemistry of the lava uh, released by USGS in the Volcano Watch that was. I, I want to say the volcano watch might have been in, in February, perhaps, and that was a result we believe from December to January, perhaps early on in the eruption. And that result uh, essentially was that the, the the magma was showing the same signal of being that 2018 summit magma chamber lava. So it wasn't fresh stuff from lower down. It was that stuff that had shown signs of degassing through that open system um, that preceded the 2018 eruption and then collapse. So after the collapse, there was still magma still left under that collapse zone. The magma chamber wasn't fully emptied. In fact, uh, the USGS publications since then have said that you know it could have been uh, perhaps uh, as much as maybe ten or eleven percent. But you know it's it's it could have been that range. You know it wasn't like a huge like the whole thing was totally squeezed out. So mm -hmm. there could have been quite a lot of magma still left, and it was some of that magma that what's not clear is if it was pushed from below by some other mechanism or the dynamics are that brought that to the surface. It, it seems like there has been filling and recovery of not just the summit, but the East Rift Zone system. And mm -hmm. the question is, was it, you know, you know, at what point is it new stuff coming from below? How fast is that, is that coming up? It has to happen at some point. The volcano has a yearly input of magmas coming in all the time. And so it's a question of, does it push it out of the way? Does it displace it or does it push it in, in a train-like fashion where it's going to come out first and then at some point later on you might see some fresher magma come out? Right? Yeah. I don't think that we've seen that. We haven't seen any sign, sign of an eruption of anything fresher coming out. It seems like it's still just the, the slightly less gassy, slightly less gassy, slightly less gassy, oozing, sluggish, sluggish for a while now. Hmm. Yeah, and that's, I mean, we really would like to see that, uh, another geochemical analysis on a fresh sample. That'd be cool. Um, and maybe, like, it's something to ask USGS about. They, 
they they're really good on their uh their twitter and their facebook and answering requests and things along those lines and if there was one request right now that we could make i'm just going to throw this out there and it, again ask nicely um insar for mauna loa would be nice to have publicly available uh i went ahead and asked them i begin to get more people asking the better but that would probably be a useful bit to have right now um and you know be nice they're, they're great people there um but yeah that, that could be good um so going on to the next one unless you want to make a comment on that no that's that's great yeah all right <laughs> um so we're talking still a lot of chemistry here and eric asks um uh, You've, you've talked about how Hawaii's lava is silica poor. How does that compare to places like Italy or Iceland in general? So um, the range of silica and lavas isn't that great a range as far as the percentages go. But along that spectrum, it makes a big difference in how, how, the, how the lavas or magmas behave. So here in Hawaii, we're somewhere in a range of 48, 49%, 50% silica content, right? And that's considered poor. That's the bottom of the range. Um, at the far upper extreme of the range, you know, you might get somewhere like maybe like Yellowstone um, that you might get up to 60% silica or more, right? But you're talking about essentially a 10% or slightly more range of the of the chemistries that, that, that disperse you know, across the, the magmas. And um, Iceland has both kinds. Uh, it's more complex. The volcano that's erupting now is similar in lava chemistry in a sense where it is also a, a, a basalt um, on a lower end. I'm not, I haven't seen the exact percentage of silica over there, but um, depending on, on how, you know, you might be able to get 51, 52%, you know, you might get slightly more silica rich than ours and still be called a basalt. And so I'm not sure exactly the difference uh, in, in percent there. Um, but they're definitely at the basalt range of the current eruption happening there now. But they've also had other eruptions that have been uh, of different chemistries of lavas as well. And I can't really speak any more to that. And uh, it, Italy, uh, if you talk about if you're talking about Etna, uh, Etna is more viscous as well. More viscous being directly related to being more silica rich too. So it's it's not all the way to the to the far end um, because it is still having episodic fountaining essentially so it's on a grand scheme of things uh, not on the high end of silicas but it's still much more so than here in hawaii to the point where you'd be able to build a pressure to have lava fountains that are in a range of three four five times taller than the ones we have here in hawaii right? just gigantic gigantic lava fountains and it's really bursting and jetting out so yeah that's that's really it right um Next question is from a boomer on YouTube. He asks about Pu'o'o. Um, if fissures rarely erupt twice, what is the risk of Pu'o'o erupting again? And is it actually a fissure at this point? Yeah, this is a question we've taken been talking about for a while, ever since during the eruption in 2018, in fact, right, is the fact that it's, it's a little bit just how you define it. If you define Pu'o'o as being that whole area, then guarantee somewhere in the area is going to erupt again because it's part of the East Rift Zone and it's going to erupt again. But whether it, it comes out of that exact hole in the ground or whether it comes out the side of that hole or uh, you know, a few hundred yards away or a half mile away, that's, that's all in the details of whether you call it pool again or not. But certainly that area is going to erupt in the Rift Zone as is everywhere on all the Rift Zones geologically, right? right? Not, not necessarily in our lives, but over geologic time. Yeah. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Give it enough time and who all I will erupt on all three rift zones, you know, it's just a matter of time. Um, all right. Well, that really actually does it for most of the questions that I have uh, lined up here, which is going to make it a quick uh, little one. We'll find uh, one to end on. How about? Um, so Mauna Loa, the, to uh, the talk about you know, it, it's been in the news a lot recently. Um, what is what is your feeling about the next event? And in, in terms of, is there a buildup? We've done this question before, but it's always good to go back. Um, like a buildup towards 
some eruption or something along those lines. Um, where are we in that process if we are in that process? I think maybe the most simple terms is to look at the U.S. just like a alert level, right? We're, we're at yellow, and that's about where we are. We're at you know, yellow. It's not orange. It's not red like it's about to come or like it looks like it might come very soon. Um, but it's going to happen at some point. But no no timeline of that, right? And, you know, we were talking off air earlier before we came on. And this, is, this is like watching the whole movie in slow motion. And we know what, how the movie is going to end. There's going to be eruption at some point. But we're watching it in slow motion. And just because we can see that scene coming and we're watching it doesn't make it come any faster. It still has to go through building and pushing every part of the volcano up and building pressure and quaking to the point where it can rupture and can come out. Like, that's that's inevitable. But that's the disconnect between the geologic time and human time. As you know, we, we now can see things happening in much more detail, and we think that that might mean that they happen on our on our agenda, and we just have to wait a little more and wait a little more and wait a little more. And we've been waiting for Mount Loader up for a long time, for a long time. And so it, it's still inevitable, just like it was inevitable for one, you know, people who know, know me for... 15, 20 years, you know, that's how long I've been saying Mauna Loa is going to rip pretty soon, right? Because it's been so long and, you know, we really, when it comes down to it, we don't know any better. That's all we have to go on. And right. so, you know, we could be surprised. It's certainly true. But as far as what we expect, expect it to be similar to every other pattern we've seen, right? A summit eruption first and, you know, building up to that with earthquakes and inflation and we have more tools now like we're asking for the insar because the insar gives us a view of everywhere on the ground surface of the volcano that's not forested which is way more places All than you've installed gps yeah. stations so right you know if, if it happens you have a gps station that's looking at just you know between one point and another point if if your movement's happening in between there right then you can catch it if it's happening outside of that then you need a third station that's beyond that on the other side of wherever that, that other focus is to then make it a new ruler and that's the challenge you know the, it's a it's there's the instrumentation on loa is there's a lot of it it's great but it's a big place it's a big big place yeah. and a lot of it's very remote so when you're looking looking at the fine little details of oh earthquakes are all clustered in this one little section right over here and what's happening right in that one little pie piece zone of Mauna Loa, then it gets a little bit trickier there. Right, yeah. right. Well, definitely. Well, we'll be watching for sure. We'll be keeping an eye on it. And we'll be back on Friday with uh, another more detailed uh, look at both of our volcanoes. Yeah, sounds great. Mahalo, everybody. For Hawaii Tracker, Dane DuPont, I'm Philip Ong.